And it was here that a professor came up with an invention that many still regard as the most significant of the 18th century. One that, in some form or another, can still be found in almost every electrical device today. That professor was Pieter van Muschenbroek. Unlike Hawksby and Gray, Muschenbroek was born into academia. But ironically enough, his breakthrough came not because of his rigorous science, but because of a simple human mistake. He was trying to find a way to store electrical charge ready for his demonstrations. And you can almost hear his train of thought as he tries to figure this out. If electricity is a fluid that flows a bit like water, then maybe you can store it in the same way that you can store water. So Muschenbroek went to his laboratory to try to make a device to store electricity. Muschenbroek started to think literally. He took a glass jar and poured in some water. He then placed inside it a length of conducting wire, which was connected at the top to a Hawksby electric machine. Then he put the jar on an insulator to help keep the charge in the jar. He then tried to pour the electricity into the jar produced by the machine via the wire down through into the water. But whatever he tried, the charge just wouldn't stay in the jar. Then one day, by accident, he forgot to put the jar on the insulator but charged it instead while it was still in his hand. Finally, holding the jar with one hand, he touched the top with the other and received such a powerful electric shock, he was almost thrown to the ground. He writes, it's a new but terrible experiment which I advise you never to try, nor would I, who've experienced it and survived by the grace of God, do it again for all the kingdom of France. So I'm going to heed his advice, not touch the top, but instead see if I can get a spark off of it. The sheer power of the electricity which flew from the jar was greater than any seen before. And even more surprisingly, the jar could store that electricity for hours, even days. So in honour of the city where Muschenbroek made his discovery, they called it the Leiden Jar. And its fame swept across the world. And very rapidly from 1745 through the rest of the 1740s, the news of this, it's called the Leiden Jar, goes global. It spreads from Japan in East Asia to Philadelphia in Eastern America. It became one of the first quick globalised scientific news items. But although the Leiden jar became a global electrical phenomenon, no one had the slightest idea how it worked. You have a jar of electric fluid, and it turns out that you get a bigger shock from the jar if you allow the electric fluid to drain away to the earth. Why is the shock bigger if the jar's leaking? Why isn't the shock bigger if you make sure that all the electric fluid stays inside the jar? That was how mid-18th century electrical philosophers were faced with this challenge. Electricity was without doubt a fantastical wonder. It could shock and spark. It could now be stored and moved around. Yet what electricity was, how it worked, and why it did all these things, was nothing less than a complete mystery.
within 10 years, a new breakthrough was to come from an unexpected quarter. From a man politically and philosophically at war with the London establishment. And even more shockingly for the British electrical elite, that man was merely a colonial, an American. This painting of Benjamin Franklin hangs here at the Royal Society in London. Franklin was a passionate supporter of American emancipation and saw the pursuit of rational science and particularly electricity as a way of rolling back ignorance, false idols and ultimately his intellectually elitist colonial masters. And this is mixed with um, a profoundly egalitarian democratic idea that Franklin and his allies have, which is this is a phenomenon open to everyone. Here's something that the elite doesn't really understand and we might be able to understand it. Here's something that the elite can't really control, but we might be able to control. And here's something above all, which is the source of superstition. And we, rational, egalitarian, potentially democratic intellectuals, we will be able to reason it out without appearing to be the slaves of magic or mystery. So Franklin decided to use the power of reason to rationally explain what many considered a magical phenomenon, lightning. This is probably one of the most famous scientific images of the 18th century. It shows Benjamin Franklin, the heroic scientist, flying a kite in a storm, proving that lightning is electrical. But although Franklin proposed this experiment, he almost certainly never performed it. Much more likely is that his most significant experiment was another one, which he proposed but didn't even conduct. In fact, it didn't even happen in America. It took place here in a small village north of Paris called marly le -Ville. The French adored Franklin, especially his anti-British politics, and they took it upon themselves to perform his other lightning experiments without him. I've come to the very spot where that experiment took place. In May 1752, George Louis Leclerc, known across France as the Comte de Buffon, and his friend Thomas Francois Delibar, erected a 40 foot metal pole, more than twice as high as this one, held in place by three wooden staves just outside Delibar's house here in Marly le Ville. The metal pole rested at the bottom inside an empty wine bottle. Franklin's big idea had been that the long pole would capture the lightning, pass it down the metal rod, and store it in the wine bottle at the base, which worked as a Leiden jar. Then he could confirm what lightning actually was. All his French followers had to do was wait for a storm. And then on May 23rd, the heavens opened. At 12.20, a loud thunderclap was heard as lightning hit the top of the pole. An assistant ran to the bottle. A spark leapt across between the metal and his finger with a loud crack and a sulfurous smell, burning his hand. The spark revealed lightning for what it really was. It was the same as the electricity made by man. It's hard to overestimate the significance of this moment. Nature had been mastered. Not only that, but the wrath of God itself had been brought under the control of mankind. It was a kind of heresy. Franklin's experiment was very important because it showed that lightning storms produce or are produced by electricity and that you can bring this 
um, electricity down. The electricity is a force of nature that's waiting out there to be tapped. Next, Franklin turned his rational mind to another question. Why the Leiden jar made the bigger sparks when it was held in the hand? Why didn't all the electricity just drain away? And drawing on his experience as a successful businessman, he saw something no one else had. That, like money in a bank, electricity can be in credit, what he called positive, or debit, negative. For him, the problem of the Leiden jar is a problem of accountancy. Franklin's idea was every body has around it an electrical atmosphere. And there's a natural amount of electric fluid around each body. If there's too much, we'll call it positive. If there's too little, we'll call it negative. And nature is organized, so the positives and the negatives always want to balance out, like an ideal American economy. Franklin's insight was that electricity was actually just positive charge flowing to cancel out negative charge. And he believed this simple idea could solve the mystery of the Leiden jar. As the jar is charged up, negative electrical charge is poured down the wire and into the water. If the jar rests on an insulator, a small amount builds up in the water. But if instead the jar is held by someone as it's being charged, positive electric charge is sucked up through their body from the ground to the outside of the jar, trying to cancel out the negative charge inside. But the positive and negative charges are stopped from cancelling out by the glass, which acts as an insulator. So instead, the charge just grows and grows on both sides of the glass. Then, touching the top of the jar with the other hand completes a circuit, allowing the negative charge on the inside to pass through the hand to the positive on the outside, finally cancelling it out. The movement of this charge causes a massive shock and often a spark. The modern equivalent of the Leiden jar is this, the capacitor and it's one of the most ubiquitous of electronic components. It's found everywhere. There are a number of smaller ones scattered around on this circuit board from a computer. They help smooth out electrical surges, protecting sensitive components, even in the most modern electric circuit. Solving the mystery of the Leiden jar and recognising lightning as merely a kind of electricity were two great successes for Franklin and the new Enlightenment movement. But the forces of trade and commerce which helped fuel the Enlightenment were about to throw up a new and even more perplexing electrical mystery. A completely new kind of electricity. This is the English Channel. By the 17th and 18th centuries, a good fraction of the world's wealth flowed up this stretch of water from all corners of the British Empire and beyond on its way to London. Spices from India, sugar from the Caribbean, wheat from America, tea from China. But of course, it wasn't just commerce. New plant and animal specimens from all over the world came flooding into London, including one that particularly fascinated the electricians. Called the torpedo fish, it'd been the stuff of fishermen's tails. 
Its sting, it was said, was capable of knocking a grown man down. But as the electricians started to investigate the sting, they realized it felt strangely similar to a shock from a Leiden jar. Could its sting actually be an electric shock? 